This is Johnny Blue Star. Welcome to Threshold, a global media event. Is the universe just a random dance of atoms, or is it a manifestation of a supremely intelligent architect? Can its purpose, or our purpose here on Earth, be adequately assessed? Can we commune with it, know its intentions, cooperate with its direction? Here, we define Threshold as a gateway state of awareness, allowing mankind to cross into a place of real cognition. Threshold allows us to approach questions of higher reality through the door of experience rather than mere belief. Welcome to Threshold, where we tear away the veil from commercial media, bringing our audience and participants into another realm of reality and enhanced communication. This is Johnny Blue Star. We're on Threshold Radio with Yelise Rugar. Now, I've got to know R- Yelise a little bit over the last few months, and uh, I find her to be very, very exciting as a person, as a seeker, and perhaps as somebody who's devoting her life to help people, organizations, and even countries in uh, transforming their own point of view in their life. So, welcome to the show, Yelise. Oh my God, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, it's an opportunity for me, uh, because I don't meet that many people who I feel very in, in a very similar wavelength to me in the way we think and what we want to accomplish. And mm-hmm. I, I know that in your case, your idea of accomplishment doesn't just include people and organizations, but actually the planet itself, the difficulties that we are facing as a whole of humanity and uh, the physical planet as well because of what's been going on in the world. Very true, very true. And how interesting, we do have miles and miles apart, but somehow we all are connected. And uh, when we start to vibrate at a level, at a common level, we tend to find each other. And thanks to technology and internet, now it's very easy to connect with people who are same, same minded, same hearted, at the same soul vibration. I think in a way, like all the mystics in the past, what they said that one day we're going to become one, I think it has just started. <laughs> It started, but it started it, right now. Maybe it's it, it definitely it's starting in a much larger proportion than the past. Because in the past, a lot of the things that you and I think about and believe in were forbidden. Period. Yes. And yes. you know, starting I don't know maybe the eighteen in this country in America the eighteen fifties with the the birth of spiritualism and theosophy. Well, anyway, with the with the birth of uh, like, for instance, Madame Blavatsky and the spiritual movement Mm -hmm. and all these Mm -hmm. other movements and the the beginning uh, interest in parapsychology, you started to move into more spiritual things like, uh, you know, the meditative disciplines and so forth. And so, eventually it became, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of books, hundreds of people you can go to, hundreds of organizations. Maybe they're not all authentic or not all v- valuable, but at least they, they are allowed to exist. That is correct. I That is one of the reasons why I love California <laughs> in America, because yeah. you get to be you and you can express who you are, what you think, and you can be anyone that you want. I'm from uh, Turkey. I'm originally from Middle East. And here it's a little bit tougher. You don't have that much of a freedom to share what you really believe in. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. It's more of a religious pressure rather than a spiritual flow. Right. And Mm. I've always believed in the freedom of the soul, freedom of the source. And once we are connected to it, once we become one and when once we become aligned with it, we start to flow with it. And that's where peace comes. That's where love comes. That's where true abundance comes. And it's a state of mind. And these are the days that we are going through pretty tough times in terms of the world, like all this war, economic crisis, because we're about to shift, we're about to change. And uh, that requires a lot of self-acknowledgement, that requires a lot of and knowing thyself. Because I do believe that whatever is happening in the world, in the macro realm, it's actually what's happening with us in the micro realm. And I do believe that it's more of us 
becoming aware of our egos and transforming them into from me consciousness into we consciousness. And eventually, one day, we all will realize that we're just a big one spirit. And if we can touch one person a day, if we can serve another soul, maybe one day we can contribute towards a world peace. Well, I do think that right now, given the situation with uh, Iran, the United mm -hmm. States and Yemen, it's that particular situation is reaching a sort of a critical stage. And I look at what's really going on. And what I see is a lot of information is being presented to people. And it's presented in such a way as being very authoritative. And it strikes me that most of the time, people don't really have the resources to really check it out. And if, mm -hmm. they do and if they do check it out, they may not be able to definitively prove anything, but they can at least go in the right direction. But I think that mm. the ultimate proof or the ultimate aspect of dealing with that situation is to go for guidance from, from your higher levels. That, that's that is sort of, very correct. And that's, although our point of view is very much out there in many ways, there's few people enunciating it in a public way. In America, one of our candidates, Marion Williamson, I may not agree yes. with everything she says, but she basically is on a spiritual path and she knows what that is. So there is some things there. And Tulsi Gabbard, she, who's a Hindu, but I think she has some understanding of, of these things. And to some degree, perhaps Bernie, Bernie Sanders. But basically, Williamson has spent her life immersed in spirituality and has written books on it and yeah. given lectures. So I feel like the, there is a high level of uh, integrity there that's based on some some form of higher level uh, awareness. They absolutely. I got to, uh, I had the privilege to see her and be in her presence and also attend two of her seminars when I used to live in Los Angeles. She's definitely coming from the heart. Yeah. And uh, almost a couple of weeks ago, there's a spiritual center that I used to go, Agape. It's a Unity Church, and uh, she was there, and I was watching it online, and she was there live and seeing her, how she's sharing her heart. It's, it's beautiful. And I do agree that there is a higher way of being, like, we are awakening every day. Um, still, I'm not very sure how this heightened level of awareness and spirituality will be able to serve to the lower consciousnesses, especially in Middle East. I don't know how that's going to be uh, practically used yet, but it is happening. Um, I moved back to Turkey in 2010 from America. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I've been in Istanbul, Izmir, Ankara. I traveled around the country, went from a city to another. I was sharing the things that I became aware of and that I learned back in California, holistic healing, being one, and um, more of finding unities rather than separations. And I got to meet with a lot of people and the most the most common thing that I was facing was everyone was looking for a fault or everyone was looking for separation, you know, like, oh my God, your path is doing this. My path is doing this. So it's almost a separation, right? Yes. So very simple thing that I asked them to do was the to change their primary question from what's wrong towards what's right in this or why a situation is happening to me. Instead of that, I ask them to ask themselves, what is this teaching me? You know, very simple things that they can use. Because this side of the world, I do believe if we would say as a humanity, as an average of the consciousness level we are at from uh, 1 to 10, I think average we're around like at 4. But Middle Eastern countries, they're still at a level of two, which means they're more coming from a need because they don't feel safe. They don't feel supported. They are in need of money, in need of food, like really survival state. So they don't have that much of time to ask themselves, oh my God, why am I here? Or what can I contribute to this world? I think in our country, at least half of the country is probably a two or a three. You would say, really? Well, well look, at, look who we voted for. I mean, <laughs> look at what's happening in the world. We're, we created a situation where we remove ourselves from an environmental treaty. We remove ourselves from a, a peaceful, fairly peaceful relationship with Iran. Uh, we, mm. uh, we're taking away, we just, there's a, a lawsuit now because our president 
has tried to remove the emission standards from California, which would also affect other other uh, states that are trying to prevent pollution and you know the threat of damage through the through the climate changes. And it just goes on and on every day. One of the most incredible things that I heard the other day is that the administration changed their point of view. What they did is they sent out letters to people who were immigrants who had children with dangerous health challenging diseases that could actually die if they didn't get the what? medical attention here. Yeah, this is true. Mm. And they, they reversed it because the, the children's parents complained and they got into, they got to Congress and they got caught. They did this secretly. And this is happening. All kinds of things like that are happening because people are yeah. separating. That's what they're mm. doing. They're mm. saying, Oh, well, yeah. my religion or my ethnicity or my citizenship mm. is better than everyone else. And, yeah. uh, and a lot of the things that I, I try and do in my programs, particularly in Alien Ball and Free, is to quote from the uh, Declaration of Independence, which says that all mm. men are created equal. Yes. And entitled to the same inalienable rights. And those rights, yeah. I believe that everybody is capable of receiving this, this higher level of consciousness. But yes, how do we deal with the, the, the levels now that are controlling everything? Yeah, that is a very good question. And that's the question that we should be looking at. It starts with one. It has to start within. So whoever you can find, whoever you can touch, whoever is in your circle of influence, that's where we're going to start from. I was very happy in California because most of the people are more aware of themselves and also the people around them. If, if I would call it like the city of angels. That would be like a heavenly state for me. And at the same time, I knew that the side of the world needed what I could offer. Yeah. So one day I saw a vision. I mean, I I was living in a very cool place in Los Angeles and I was managing a wellness center. It was a beautiful place. But then one day after attending an event where we had very deep meditations, I saw a vision that's happening in 2020 in Istanbul, actually. So it's almost like one more year to go. <laughs> and what was and it? Uh, the vision. The vision was uh, I was at a big arena, almost like 20 maybe 30,000 people and many of the leaders, not only spiritual, but political leaders and a lot of people, we gathered for peace. So people were becoming more aware of what's needed in this in, in this area and they were coming together. I think I even saw Oprah. Really? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. In your vision, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure it was Anthony Robbins and I saw Madonna, but maybe, maybe, maybe later on I was like thinking about it. And now knowing that uh, she's also very interested in helping more in this region, maybe she was there too. But then I said to myself, oh, oh my God, but if dream, if if a dream is you know given to you, that means it will be revealed through you and through other people too. It's a matter of taking action. And uh, less than six months, I found myself with two red uh, luggages in Istanbul. <laughs> so there I was uh, going uh, city by city and um, looking for ways to inspire people for unity, for awareness, for peace. And there I was teaching people how to energize themselves through juicing and eating vegetables rather than, you know, meat-based diet or, you know, just letting go of the chicken and dairy and all those things. And there I was, I found myself sharing transformational events, so maybe we could change one person at a time. It's well, been quite an interesting journey since then. Well, Actually, certainly, that's how I met you too. <laughs> yes, well, and we're going to discuss more about that in just a couple of minutes, and we'll be right back. Sure. This is Johnny Blue Star, CEO of New Galaxy Enterprises, a media content development company. Initially, I wanted to be a playwright, but once in college, I fell in love with movies and have been writing my own and for clients for many years. No, I'm not entrenched in Hollywood. But I think if you look at my samples, you can determine if I can capture the drama and power of your idea. I'm up to refining your work to professional quality. I've worked on dramatic films, comedy, science fiction, documentaries, and even musicals. I have several books published now that are the beginning of book and film franchises. To learn more about New Galaxy, see samples of our work, or talk to us about your project, please go to www.NewGalaxyEnterprises.com and fill out the contact form. 
The following is from West Side Warrior, the memoir of Ray Boyland, a Korean War veteran and crime fighter. He was there fighting in the world's coldest battlefield when the Chinese communists invaded. Desperate squad members ran past our foxhole yelling, Get the hell out of here! There's too many of them! Again, we saw the Chinese soldiers charge again with opium-induced mindlessness, oblivious of our bullets. Again, we heard the bugles and whistles. Climbing out of our foxhole, Bob dropped two hand grenades behind us, and I threw one over my shoulder. Bullets whizzing by our heads, Bob and I became bolts of lightning flashing across the mountainside. Like a hideous film, desperate scenes like this played out on the Tokong Pass for three days. Sometimes I played in the scene. Sometimes I could only watch and wonder if it were real, or if I'd be suddenly jolted out of my trance by an RKO usher saying, Hey, did you kids sneak in here? To acquire this book, Google westsidewarrior.boylan.kindle. Boylan is spelled B-O-Y-L-A-N. That's Westside Warrior, Boylan, Kindle. The following song is called Awareness. It's by Lightstorm, a spiritual band with an acute understanding of how far our culture has fallen from the consciousness spoken of in this remarkable piece of music. One of its key lyrics says, Awareness, the root of all, body, mind, and soul, is the goal.
We're back on Threshold Radio with Elise Ruzgar, who is a power coach. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And uh, what I'm interested in initially is I want to know how you got into this whole thing. Of course, eventually I'd like to know how you got into power coaching, which is something you, you do right now. But how did you start? When were you first interested in this kind of knowledge, this kind of understanding of the universe? <laughs> Hmm, interesting. I think it was when I was 13, <laughs> that way long back, I came across with a sacred book when I was crossing from a side to another side in the city on a boat, just ah. by coincidence. Ah. Out of nowhere, I found a book sitting on the deck and I picked up the book and the book was written from back to front. So it was quite interesting. And the sentences were starting from right to left. So it was the other way around that we use in, in, in English and Turkish. And it was a language that I didn't know, that I didn't speak. So I put that book into the shelf. So it became a shelf help rather than a self help because <laughs> I wasn't able to speak the language. But then it led me to question many things, like um, because it, it did write in English that it's a spiritual a path. So I started to search for that. I started to take yoga classes, and this was in, in Turkey. This was nine after when I was 13, and then years passed. 1994 was the first time that I took an NLP book from a friend of mine. And at that time, we didn't have much internet at home. So he would send me books from Africa. So I would read those books. And it was NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And later on, I got really, really interested in how and why, why we do the things that we do, why some people can achieve their dreams or feel happy all the time, but why some of them like nag about things and then create wars and fights and everything. So the question why was very important in my life. And I followed that why. I decided to take further classes in psychology and NLP and holistic approach. So I moved to California. That's how it started. Ah. Yes. And now uh, one of the very most interesting things is one day when I was going through a personal challenge, I was having, I was diagnosed with a bleeding cyst and uh, I didn't have um, much money at that time. I didn't have my stability. I didn't have certainty in my life. So one night I was in pain and I was crying and I was driving in the car and out of nowhere I said like, come on God, show me a sign that everything's going to be okay. You know, when you're so desperate, that's the time you start to pray. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And I prayed the other day too. Yeah. yeah. But you know, when it's all happy and everything, you're like, oh, this is great. But <laughs> when it's, you're in pain and you're in tears. So that's, it was one of those times. And I was like, God, please show me a sign that it's going to be, everything's going to be okay. And as I was driving, I turned my head on the right corner. I saw a building. And there was this big, actually, post on the building, and it said, nothing is a coincidence. This is a sign. No way! Really? <laughs> pulling, yeah. Yes! Yes, it was, this was on Robertson Boulevard. And I pulled the car over, and I parked, and I got out of the car, and it was a rainy day. And I'm like, uh, walking towards this building, because I really wanted to know what this building is. And I saw this ancient wooden door. I knocked on the door, and... Uh, Cinderella dressed woman opened the door. So I'm <laughs> really? At this elderly woman. She has the Cinderella dress on, and I'm like, what the F C U thing? And then she goes like, oh dear, it's so good that you found us. We're a spiritual center, but tonight is a very special uh, closed party. I won't be able to get you in. But just to let you know, tonight we do celebrate past lives. And this is a party about that. <laughs> I'm like, how cool is that? And then she goes like, yeah, we have these introductory classes. Why don't you come along on Tuesday? So I, was, I got back in the car. I had this huge smile on my face. There was my sign and there was a spiritual center. And then next week, of course, I couldn't wait for a Tuesday. And I'm like right there in the very front uh, row sitting. This guy at the stage talking about spirituality, oneness, physim, Kabbalah, like many, many different paths. And then he goes like, and, and this is the book that we will be reading. And then he hands out the book and he says, it's written in Aramaic, which is the language of the uh, prophet. So we don't speak that language any uh, anymore. So he hands the book. Guess which book it's, it is. Guess which book it is? 
Well, if I, I could be from the Nakamati <laughs> Library, like the Gospel of Thomas. Could be, but this was the book that I found on the boat when I was 13. No, really? <laughs> yes. In that language? <laughs> Same book. Oh, my gosh. I was like, what? Like, it was just, it, I just couldn't explain it. And I told him that I found this book on the boat, and he goes like, really? In Turkey, in Izmir? And it happened to be one of the founders of that spiritual center, two of them actually, lived in Izmir, the city that I'm from. And this is like Ottoman Empire times, you know, like way, way, way long time ago. And he said that, oh, there was a sect that keep on reading that book. Maybe could that. But he's like, it's only one million people who are studying this book. How the heck, you know? It was so interesting. So, of course, I decided to keep on uh, studying uh, that spiritual path. What was so the spiritual did, path? This is uh, between something Sufism and Kabbalah. So, well, it's all about more, unity. Could you be more specific about it? Tell us a little more about it. <laughs> no, I got you all curious about it, right? So well, the book I, I called, <laughs> well, that's I mean, yeah. and that's interesting. Sufism and Kabbalah. It was, yes, yes. It, it it was more. It was all about oneness, and uh, the the book was not written, but the book came to Abraham. So it was before the prophets. You know, Abraham started the one. God religions in all humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the book that was downloaded at that era. And there are many versions of it, you know, like as we human, because our minds are mean making machines. Like whatever we read, whatever we do, we constantly were making, we're getting a meaning from it. So from that book, many other people made different meanings and more path um, came out of that book. Okay. And uh, it goes ba back to hermetic teachings. Simply, did you ever did like, you ever read it in English or in Turkish? Or yes, yes. Well, what's English, the name yes. of it? The name of the book is called Zohar. Oh, the Zohar. Yes, that's a yeah. that's the central book of of Kabbalah. That's right. That's right. That is correct. Yeah, that book in the Sefer Yitzira. That's right. Exactly. And even itself, it had different teachers. So it's it's almost like yoga. You know, yoga has 1,000 different ways of being practiced. We would just think that yoga is one, but it's the same with Kabbalah. Different teachers, different paths, different books, even though they are called same name, the way that it was interpreted and the way that it was practiced differs how we relate to it. Well, that's very interesting. So you studied that for quite some time. Yes, I have studied that almost like 13 years, 13, 14 years. So, you, I, so you're studying the Zohar very carefully still? I have studied that, that's right, in the past, and still I would say I would, I, I am. And at the same time, I got to meet with Sufi masters, mm -hmm. which would read the book from Rumi. And um, quite interesting, when I was in high school, and this was around like 12, 13 too, that was the Mesnevi, was the book that I loved the most. You know, they would teach us at high school. And the teachings and whatever it says was exactly the same as Zohar would teach. It was all about love and light. Both books would say there's nothing but just love being channeled through us to the world. Yeah, I, stu I studied Persian, Farsi, in order to study Rumi, actually. I never really got that wow. far. But I'll tell you a synchronistic story if you Please want to hear do. one. Please do. Yes. This is how I found my first teacher. See, I spent a, I, I became basically, I was brought up Jewish and I became a reformed Jewish, which is kind of vague. And the rabbi, I, I always was studying other religions, even when, I think even in grammar school. But the rabbi took us to different religions, a confirmation class, 14 years old. And I went to the Vedanta Society. And in, in the Vedanta Society, which was founded by Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, I saw mm -hmm. all the symbols of these different religions on the on the wall. You know, the cross and the on the Zoroastrian al fire altar and uh, the Jewish star and so forth. And I said, "Oh my God, this is where I'm at. All religions really have a core." You know, and yeah. I started to study Ramakrishna. I found Ramakrishna's teachings a little bit too strict. A little bit. Um, there were some problems I had with that. I started to search. And I finally came on to, and I don't know if we ever mentioned this, Uspensky and Gurdjieff, you know who they are? Mm -mm, no, I don't. Well, I found a book called In Search of the Miraculous, and it was basically a man reporting the teachings of George Gurdjieff 
who was an Ar- Armenian Russian who basically had studied all over the you know that area the, in Asia and had come up with a certain teaching. Well, I was very interested in this teaching. I won't go into it. I'll just say that part of this teaching concerned that's kind of what I thought was a kind of spiritual alchemy. Anyway, so I, um, by that time, I had studied many things, but there was a book that was written. It was called The Teachers of Gurdjieff. And what it said was that there was a, like, a foundation called the Gurdjieff Foundation and some other things, but they were all defunct. They no longer mattered. But the truth fact was, is that Gurdjieff was a Sufi. Mm, now, I, I had very little experience you know, of actual related to a lot of different organizations. I had some, but I disbelieved the book. And I began to study Persian. I left school. I went to Yale to be with with friends of mine there for a while. And um, I studied, I found somebody in Yale who was actually a Sufi, and he he taught me certain things, and I was particularly interested in Rumi. Mm -hmm. And so I um, decided, no, I've got to go there. I've got to find these teachers. (laughs) Interesting. So you I, mean like this here I in ha- Turkey and Iran, right? I have to. I'm in. I'm in New York, and I. I mean, I was in New Haven. And I went back to New York, where I had I, to Manhattan, and I. I had. I had found out from the Persian embassy that there was a American who they referred me to when I said I wanted to learn Persian. Well, so I, I met this American and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Campbell, and so I'm going to meet. Their teacher, who was the who was the head of the Ministry of Education in in Iran during the Mossadegh regime, and he had to leave. You know, remember the Mossadegh regime? That was the yep. first democratic yep. government in Iran. Anyway, so uh, we were going there, and he asked, "Why do you want to study Persian?" I said, "Oh, well, there's this book called The Teachers of Gurdjieff, and it, I was really interested in the Gurdjieff Foundation, but it no longer works; it's defunct." And uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and so. So I'm going there, you know, I want to study it so I can go over to Persia. And they said, well, the Gurdjieff Foundation is not been, is not defunct. We've been there for um, 10 or 15 years. I said, what? <laughs> so they were actually members, of, they were followers of Gurdjieff. So we, but they were interested in, Suf, in Sufism. And, then they, and we went and this guy basically, when he taught us, and I, I didn't get very much out of it, but it was very academic he memorized the mouth of we practically. I mean, he's an incredible memory, and he's a very smart guy. And and then after that period, I started to talk to these people, and I did some exercises. I had my first real experience. I had my first real experience, and I spent two years with them. And after those two years, you can't believe this, but this this uh, they met somebody named Malik Nia, a Sufi, mm-hmm. and they became Sufis. Mm. And they left the Gurdjieff Foundation. They caused a tremendous disruption among a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I eventually started to study with a, a former teacher of theirs who actually knew enough to keep me going to take me to another level because I found that after a certain point, what was happening there was not really that interesting to me. And then they left and and I was totally rejected because I, I didn't follow their teacher and I lost a lot of my friends. But but that's kind of synchronicity, right? <laughs> I mean, I, it is. I, it is. So it and all also, it all was tra- tracking down Rumi and tracking down the the great uh, Sufi masters, you know. And and yes. I so that's it. I understand that book was probably a false book, but the profundity of the Sufi teachings, I have no doubt of doubt about. Absolutely, and also in Sufism, they say that. In a way, if you would call it as an ashram, because ashram is a Hindu way of, you know, gathering, but um, Sufis do have very similar houses. It's called dargah, similar to ashrams. You go there, just like the one that you mentioned, and the founder or the teacher or the master, I shall say, can open up not all, all the doors for your soul. So he holds let's say, one or two keys for your soul ascendance. Once they're done, like once you're done with that Darya ashram, you have to leave. <laughs> There's no other way. Because what happens is your soul's keys are being transferred to another ashram, to another master. Ah. So that you, yes, so that you keep on searching. You cannot stay at uh, Darya 
all your life. It's almost like, how should I say, it's against its natural flow. Well, listen, Yelise, I have to take a break now and we'll be right back and continue with exactly that point. All right. My company, New Galaxy Enterprises, is a California corporation specializing in the creation of media and promotional content. We are focused on original, innovative projects that are good for humanity. These projects could be nonfiction books or novels, fictional screenplays or documentary content, websites and website content, commercial advertising content for print, audio or video products on the internet, television or radio, musical scores for advertising, television or film, video, audio editing, etc. We want to promote products and projects that support the environment, encourage a healthy experience in living, developing, nurturing, and useful technology, and offering platforms for positive, socially constructive entertainment or informative, transformative media. Our experience in creating a variety of products like this is rather vast, and we offer client-based and collaborative products, as well as the opportunity of active investors to join us in the creation and promotion of proprietary products, some of which are in latter stages of development. For more information, go to www.NewGalaxyEnterprises.com. That's www.NewGalaxyEnterprises.com. If you're interested in talking to us, just fill out the contact sheet and we will get back with you. Are you confused about so much information on health issues? Do you find it hard to trust the sources of conflicting advice? Try Dr. Rodier's newsletters and blogs based on the latest information published in the best medical and nutritional journals. There's no charge for subscribing. Just log on to hugorodier.com. That's H-U-G-O-R-O-D-I-E-R.com to do so or to download Dr. Rodier's latest publications. Well, we're back on Threshold Radio with Elise Rusgar. And Elise has been kind of opening up to me uh, some of the information about the way the Sufi teaching is transmitted. And it's kind of funny because it's very similar to what was in that book that I was called call the teachers of Gurdjieff, where he would go from one master to another, in, in a Sufi master to another. Um, mm. But I believe that, um, you know, the spiritual path, like you say, it's, you know, there's many different ways, right? And so, and so did you actually go into the spiritual path, the Sufi path? I have. And so you went from different teachers? Yeah, I went from actually a total of three different teachers. My path has been interesting. It started with the book that I shared with you, Zohar. So it started with the, in a way, ashram or center, whatever you call it, through Kabbalah. Yeah. But I am Muslim. I was born as a Muslim. And then I found this Jewish tradition on the path. And I followed that one. And after the 13th year, the Sufi master, which Rumi passed the red carpet. Shamsa de Tabriz, right? Oh, that's the... But uh, his, his teacher, Te- his teacher. Yeah, Shams of Tabriz actually um, almost, it's a representation of the, the yin energy, the dark side or feminine energy form. And Rumi would be the light form, the masculine form. So they together created a yin and yang and they started to turn right mm-hmm. but um the after the teachings that i did with the kabbalah center i found myself back in turkey and that time the guy who rumi passed the red carpet to hasan dede he actually called me i don't know how, how, he, how got could he how could he call you since I rumi lived rumi lived in the 13th century that's right. But what happens is when he is passing, you know, when he is changing this reality form, his soul passes the teachings or how should I say, he passes the light that he has brought to this world to another soul, that power, so that they could hold a space for others. So when Sufi passed in a spiritual realm, he would come to this guy, Hassan Dede's dreams. And in his dreams, he would do the initiation. Wow. You're saying this was a living person, though, in this century, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you're saying he, he, rece- in- he received this light from Rumi. He re- yes, he received all these teachings in his dreams. Uh, they call it, in Turkish, it's called in English, that would be initiation or giving a hand 
from a hand to another one, passing the lineage to another soul until that person leaves this physical plane. So this guy was called Hassan Dede. He actually recently died last year. And almost like four or five years ago, when I came back to Turkey, he called me. So I went to his ashram, his dergya. And uh, he was he was full of light. The night, that night wow. after I left him and his prayers, and also I watched, a sh- not a show, but the uh, prayers of the whirling dervishes. Oh my God, that was the best sleep I've ever got. In the morning when I woke up, I felt like I was a newborn. Uh He was that much powerful. What he does is such high level souls, they actually clean your aura. That's what they do. You know, during the day, we have a lot of negative people around. We have toxic people, toxic thoughts and emotions, the food. So that affects our whole energy, which is called aura. But when you spend some time with a high elevated soul like him, it cleanses all your holistically energy. So it was quite isn't interesting there, journey. Isn't there a word, and maybe Turkish, Vorjud, presence? Vorjud. Yes, yes. Uh, and another, another word is that I think it's used in Sufism, is the presence is called Baraka. Baraka. Hmm. Mm-hmm. In other I'll words, a person has Baraka, he has that presence or the Vorjud. I'm not sure if I'm using the words correctly, but in the presence <laughs> of a master, yes. you can experience the the transformation you can experience his his embodiment of that presence yes very correct very correct when richard alpert and tim leary got involved mm-hmm. in the psychedelic movement at one point richard alpert sort of was not sure of it and he went to india and he met a master there and he came back and um I was there. I had told him, I actually met him and I told him to get off of drugs. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I met him at the, um, the Illumination of the Buddha. It was like a, at the Fillmore, Fillmore East. It was like a celebration with Tim Leary. This was in the, old, the sort of towards the end of the psychedelic movement. And he said, well, yeah, you know, I, Meher Baba has been telling me that too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I guess he decided to. And I was surprised when he came back and he looked so different. And he was dressed in, um, you know, in robes and he had a beard and he didn't, wasn't wearing glasses and he was much, much thinner than he had been. He was like a completely different person. And I remember him saying in this crowd of people who had, were welcoming him back, he said, I sometimes feel like the Joker carrying the, jo- the crown jewels to the king. And then there was this wave of consciousness, of spiritual energy, and I, just incredible wave of it. And, uh, you know, so that, that was sort of Baraka. Yes, absolutely. And it is quite interesting that we can tap in and out of these states. Uh, Tony Robbins calls them states. The Sufis call them hal. From one hal, from one state to another. Uh, uh, from one hal, that's how. Hal, yeah. Hal yeah. is H-A-L. Yeah. From one hall to another, we are flowing in the river of life, they call it. So in the morning when you wake up, sometimes sadness hall comes, sometimes happiness comes, sometimes pain comes, sometimes joy comes. Whatever it comes, we just welcome it. We don't resist, but let it be. We don't cling onto it. We just let it flow through. And whatever comes, it's more than welcome, you know, as Sufis say. Well, you know, in per, in, in Farsi, uh, when you say hello, you say, Hale Shomache Tore, which means, what is your state? It's like yes. the word how. And then yes. there's another important word that I learned, which is wh- when you have how, you have like a, an illumination or an insight. It's a, a spiritual a spiritual state. But when it's, and it, it, it may be ephemeral, it may not last long, but when it stabilizes, it becomes a mahamat or station. Mark, that's right. Very correct. Markaba, they also talk about this with the um, flower of life from Dranvula. I don't know if you know him. I think he is, he talks about that a lot. Markaba of a person. 
it's almost like the ascended star when you become whole within you when you reach to a self actualization you start to eliminate and people look at you and they're like oh my god you're somehow shining something's happening with you what's yeah. up uh, but it's just a spiritual awareness or spiritual consciousness that you can tap into and you can come off from that consciousness also later on you can tap back into that and just like speaking with you or speaking with people that are aware of these realms that would elevate your soul but when you're connected with people at a second level or, or a third level low consciousness i should say or if you hang out with people that are angry all the time or bitter all the time or nagging all the time then your consciousness your shine drops too oh wow this has been such an exciting conversation You know, the next time we talk, we haven't even got into the things that you're doing now. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I think that uh, I'm going to have to ask you if we could please have another conversation like this and go on with your journey. I would love that, and I also want to hear all the beautiful things that you're doing. Well, thank you so much, and uh, so we'll see you soon. All right, thank you very much. The Coalition is a unique project designed to empower its members both individually and collectively. Besides individual empowerment, its broader focus is on the restoration, protection, and enhancement of citizen and human rights throughout the world through the aid of its members. As this project is centered in the United States, our first task is to create a website and social network infrastructure to promote collective efforts to take back our rightful control as citizens over our government as designed by our founding fathers. Although we must begin with the social network restricted to United States citizens, the organization will also host a global dialogue for the discussion of human rights by citizens of democratic nations throughout the world. If you're interested, Please check us out in the gofundme.com website entering in the search field the coalition for planetary empowerment that is go to gofundme.com and enter in the search field the coalition for planetary empowerment This is Johnny Blue Star imagine a dark night the wind is crisp and cool the sky cloudless and majestic Perhaps you are walking alone or with a loved one. Scattered about the night sky are thousands upon thousands of points of light. Look above you, friends of this restless planet. Out there into the night sky, unknown worlds await. Beauty behind imagination, intelligence beyond comprehension, life in its infinite forms and variations, yet all from the same seed, the same fundamental vibration. A cosmic tapestry of infinite light at each thread unique and indispensable look above you out into the vastness of the night sky for your destiny lies out there somewhere among the stars we go out with a song by singer songwriter Zave Nathan and Bonnie Blazak it's called believe this is a kind of anthem to hope and freedom the lyrics say we mustn't forsake forget who we are as the future and the past are written in the stars Every day of our life we should pray to the sky we are one we are one you and i and we must in forsake and forget who we are as a future and past are written in the stars every day of our lives we should pray to the sky we are one we are love you and i
Forgiveness and forsake, forget who we are As our future and past are written in the stars Every day of our life we should pray to the sky We are one, we are left Our life, we should pray to the sky.